Hey guys, uh, we are recording. It is Wednesday. It is February 10th, and what a great time to be together for another Topher Spin Meteorites Hangout. We got a good group. Uh, I got some uh, three international videos, um, a super cool story about a YouTube subscriber who sent me a sample, and we got some other good stuff. Um, I... Ron, I don't want to put you on the spot right away, but if if you're ready, I, I want to introduce something that uh, is going to be uh, something unique and something fun that we're going to be doing here weekly. Uh, and I am taking, uh, we have nine or eight more spots left for volunteers, but each week we're going to be taking a tour of a different, we're going to be taking a tour of our solar system. And each week we're going to be stopping at a different place and I've tasked people to volunteer step I actually tapped Ron and said you're going first thanks for volunteering <laughs> everyone else everyone else stepped I back. volunteered yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I, I remember that conversation and I don't think I volunteered <laughs> yeah um it was it was one of those things where I, I was looking at it and I'm like I need people who don't mind getting in front of the camera who like I don't, I, I try to act responsible and sound intelligent, but I'm not, I don't put on airs. So I don't really care what people think about me if I make a corny joke or, or, and it, and it lands flat. Um, but each week we're going to have a volunteer step up and give us a, a tour, uh, some details, some fun information, a five minute little information about a random place that was picked for them and this is uh the catalyst of this was my wife bought me a calendar last year and every month i had a beautiful picture to look at and now the year is gone and i still want to look at those pictures so this is the best way to incorporate those pictures back into my life for the next three months so we have 12 opportunities to learn more about our solar system and the first stop on our solar system I didn't even know what it was until, well, I, I still have a vague idea of what it is. Ron, you want to be our tour guide? Sure. This is, the, this is a little impromptu, because I had four hours to do this, uh, tour of Kepler 10b. It's an exoplanet. I believe it's in the constellation Cyg Cygna. Um, so let me share my screen. And, and huge, let's... huge thanks for Ron being our guinea pig because no one else really wanted to do it until they wanted to see, until they wanted to see it done first. But uh, everyone's going to put their own flair on it. Let me get this thing going here. There we go. Okay, this is the photo that uh, that Topher sent me. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. All right. So this is the to, so I, I'm going to do a little travel log. We're going to go take a vacation. So, pretend I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a tour guy. Book your next green vacation to the exoplanet Kepler-10b. Up here it says, some like it hot. Very hot place. <laughs> so, the, the, um, the, the planet was discovered by the Kepler telescope on January 10th, 2011. The Kepler telescope has been decommissioned. It ran out of fuel. But in its lifetime, it discovered hundreds of, of planets orbiting stars. The telescope was, was first named for the 17th century astronomer Johann Kepler, 1671-1630. And that's his handsome face right there. He was, a, he was like a man, a man for all seasons. He was an astronomer, an astrologer, mathematician. He did it all. I like his and goatee. <laughs> pardon me? I like his goatee as well. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's what that's how they did it back then. That's got some flair. Mustaches. Anyway, so uh, where is this magical place you ask? Well, it's right there. <laughs> it's <laughs> in all those constellations. It's right there. You can still see it uh, right, right there. Yep. All right. So, so if you're gonna take a trip, it's just a short 564 light year trip from Earth, and you'll be there before you know it. And this is a little video I'm going to play. We're going to actually go. There's Cygnus that's in that constellation right up at the top. Now that is the field of view of the Kepler telescope. 
It's going to push them a little bit more and get a little more detail. It's just amazing to me that they can actually see these things. Wow. We're not, not quite there yet. <clears throat> going to push them a little bit more. There we go. And there you go. That bright star right in the middle. Jeez. That's the, that's the resolution this thing had. It's just amazing. I don't even see how they can pick out one little I know. star. Let's see an exoplanet. Now that's just the that's the sun for the for the for the planet we're going to look at. So in relative to Earth, because this is a our, the first this is the first planet they found that was about Earth sized. Mm -hmm. You can see here's Uranus over here, and there's some other Kepler things got found. Here's 10b right here compared to Earth. It's about 1.4 times the size, but about 2.7 times the mass. All right, so this is uh, so far away, we don't know a whole bunch, but, but here's on your trip, here are the luxurious amenities you're gonna have. One side of the planet always faces its star. So you get your choice of warm, very warm beaches on the molten side. <laughs> <laughs> you get some continuous nightlife on the much cooler rocky side. Just nice. <laughs> there are no pesky bugs to bother you because there's no atmosphere. All right. And it's the ultimate Star Trek fantasy come true. Trekkies can experience what living on Vulcan feels like. Spock ears are provided at no extra charge. Nice. So <laughs> I think I want the cool side of the planet with the nightlife. Uh, okay. <laughs> Here's some fun facts that we just we know about Kepler. First, it's the first Earth-sized rocky exoplanet to be discovered. It's approximately 1.4 times the size of Earth. The average temperature of the surface is 2,840 2, degrees Fahrenheit. So bring your sunblock. Wow. It's 20 times closer to its sun than Mercury is to our sun. That's pretty close. Yeah. And the or one orbit takes 20 hours. A year is 20 hours long. <laughs> 20 Earth hours long. And so what are you waiting for? Come join us for a fun adventure on beautiful exoplanet Kepler 10b. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you so I'm, much, man. I'm not done. Hang on. Oh, Hang on. oh, wait. wow. But wait, there's more. <laughs> I have a little more serious video here. Let me pull this up. This is you actually NASA. you actually made that art, didn't you? No, no, actually, oh. this is Kepler 10b. This is their logo for it. Oh wow, that that's a, <laughs> a great description based on what a, a great um, based on your yeah. description. It's a great depiction. Yeah, the, the the smiling face I don't get, but you know whatever. <laughs> okay, let me pull this video up here. Kepler 10b orbits one of the 150,000 stars that the spacecraft is monitoring between the constellations of Cygnus and Lyra. We aim our mosaic of 42 detectors there under the swan's wing, just above the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. The star itself is very similar to our own sun in temperature, mass, and size, but older, with an age of 11.9 billion years compared to the 4.5 billion years of our own sun. It's a quiet star, slowly spinning, with a weak magnetic field and few of the sunspots that characterize our own sun. The star is about 560 light years from our solar system and one of the brighter stars that Kepler's monitoring. It was the first we identified as potentially harboring a very small transiting planet. The transits of the planet were first seen in July of 2009. 560 light years. It occurred to me that when the light from this star began its journey toward Earth, European navigators were crossing the Atlantic Ocean for the first time in search of new horizons. Today we're still exploring, and our crow's nest is a space telescope called Kepler. One day, the oceans we cross will be the galaxy itself. But for now, we imagine the worlds we discover by putting all that we've learned from our observations and analyses into the fingers of artists. Here you see Kepler 10b as a scorched world, orbiting at a distance that's more than 20 times closer to its star than Mercury is to our own sun. The daytime temperature is expected to be more than 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit, hotter than lava flows here on Earth. Intense radiation from the star has kept the planet from holding on to an atmosphere, but here we see flecks of silicates and iron that have boiled off a molten surface and are swept away by the stellar radiation 
Oh. Much like a comet's tail when its orbit brings it close to the sun. Many years ago, before Kepler, our team built a robotic telescope at Lick Observatory to learn to do transit photometry. We called it the Vulcan Telescope, named after the hypothetical planet that scientists in the 1800s thought might exist between the Sun and Mercury. A planet that might explain the small deviations in Mercury's orbit that were later explained with Einstein's theory of general relativity. Vulcan is the god of fire in Roman mythology, a name befitting of a world so close to the Sun. When I saw the artist's rendering of Kepler 10b for the first time, the thought that immediately came to my mind was that this is our planet Vulcan. We'd come full circle in our quest, and we know that we've only begun to imagine the possibilities. Okay. That's pretty awesome. That's it. Very uh, cool. Ron, thank you so much. That was so, the so interesting, man. Yeah, so close to its sun that it boiled off the silicates. Yes, that's the that, that that's what would be the crust for Earth. So yeah, pretty much. You know, and um, you know, Mercury is uh, our closest to the sun planet, and that's twenty times closer to its sun. Yes, that's. That's crazy. So now when anyone ever mentions the Kepler telescope or Kepler 10B, we all know exactly what, what they're talking about. Yeah, so that, that was about, you know, there's very little information on it. So I, I was looking at different places. Um, it was discovered, uh, I don't know, what did I say, 10 years ago? Uh, the, the telescope itself has been, has ran out of fuel. So it's, it's, it's been decommissioned. So I think they have other telescopes out there now but uh, as far as this one goes it's pretty well done yeah that actually brings me to something that uh i want to talk about i i, I want to show because uh, i talked about it last week and that's something that we're going to be tracking here on the hangouts so hold on one second okay Okay, so one of the things that I want to do on the Meteorite Hangouts is make sure that we stay current on meteorite events, but also space events, so space exploration. So that's one of the, one of the goals about learning about a different place in our, in our own Milky Way uh, um, each week. Now, last week I talked about, and I really demonstrated it with my hands very poorly, how the uh, Perseverance rover is going to land on Mars. So I found a video from, uh, from JPL, and it is a fantastic video. And it's going to be really, really cool to be a part of this. We're going to be tracking it and giving you weekly updates. Um, but for those that don't know, Perseverance is going to be landing on the surface of Mars on February 18th. So today's the 10th, that's, no, that's next Thursday. Um, the, one of the main goals of the um, Perseverance rover is to uh, do extensive drilling for signs of previous life on Mars. That's one of the main objectives. So the uh, landing area has been chosen as a, um, what appears to be a, uh, a delta that uh, washed a bunch of debris out at the end of an old uh, extinct water flow. So that's where, that's one of the places, that's where they're going to land and start their work. But whereas other uh, like Pathfinder, their main objective was chemistry uh, of what the geochemistry of the rock samples. Um, one of the main objectives of Perseverance is actually searching for life or signs of previous life. Um, what's really cool about the event on February uh, 18th, and you should really try to avoid working for a living and watching the live broadcast, um, it, it, they have cameras mounted all over the, the, the thing and microphones. So you're actually going to hear and see it 14 minutes late, but live. Um, so here's a little video about the actual landing of the Perseverance on the, uh, on the surface. This flyover was produced from NASA images taken from orbit. 
The blue circle indicates the area the rover will likely land. The arcing hills in the center, about 1,600 feet high and are the rim of Jezero Crater. The central goal of Mars 2020 is to learn whether life ever existed on Mars. It's too cold and dry for life to exist on the Martian surface today. But after Jezero Crater formed billions of years ago, water filled it to form a deep lake, about the same size as Lake Tahoe. Eventually, as Mars climate changed, Lake Jezero dried up and surface water disappeared from the planet. An ancient lake is a fantastic place to pursue our goal of looking for possible Martian life. On Earth, lakes are filled with living creatures. Evidence of that life is often preserved in the mud and sand deposited on the bottom of the lake. So, we use the rover's instruments to explore the rocks of the ancient lake bed. Here we can see evidence of the former lake. The canyon cutting through the crater rim was carved by a river. As the water entered the lake, it slowed and dropped the sand and mud it was carrying to form the fan-shaped delta. The white line is a path the rover might follow in its first two years, called the prime mission. During this period, we use the rover science instruments to analyze the lake sediments. After we explore the delta, we hope to investigate the shoreline of the former lake. To get there, we have to traverse around a sea of modern sand dunes. From this perspective, you can see former shorelines curving around a headland. We can picture waves in Lake Jezero beating on a sandy beach. And finally, we will press on to the crater rim. Jezero Crater formed when a large object collided with Mars, excavating rocks from deep in the Martian crust, exposing them in the rim for us to study. These rocks would have been hot shortly after the impact and may have hosted hot springs. Deposits from these springs would be another target in our search for possible ancient life on Mars. There we go. Uh, that is a really, really cool video. Yeah. And you know what's actually pretty funny about it is uh, I, I watched two videos and I, I downloaded both i put the wrong one in the presentation <laughs> the one i was supposed to show today was the actual separation and landing on the surface and the retro jets firing so <laughs> well we, you can do that next week <laughs> yeah because it'll be the day before yeah good good yeah so, that that video was awesome seeing the the uh uh, bench lines there. A lot of that geography you could see in in uh, the basin of range country in Nevada. Not the impact part of it, but uh, mm -hmm. the yeah. alluvial fans and the. I can't get over the detail of photography. Yeah, well, we um, we put. I I think the the latest one is the. Excuse me. Shots often tell the story of the situation by focusing on a relatively small portion of. Dang. Um, I think it's the MRO, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, um, did a bunch of really high resolution uh, photography in multiple different wavelengths. And uh, they even did some amount of spectroscopy of the surface. And that the last uh, bit of video with all the false colors, I think, is the spectroscopy uh, part of it. But. Yeah. We're living pretty, in amazing times. Yeah, it's, it was pretty cool. Um, it, the that was actually, like I said, that was next week's video when we actually, or hopefully, landing and and. But at least I did a, a halfway decent intro, and I, that's where I got the information from. So, <laughs> um, but that was so. Uh, next week we'll definitely show the actual landing and well separation and landing and retro firing and then separation again. Again, there, there's microphones and cameras set up all over it, and then Perseverance itself has 11 cameras. Uh, and they, in the, the video that I meant to show that you're going to see uh, next week, I was amazed how I, the animation has to be accurate because it's JPL, but they kept drilling and drilling and drilling. And, and I'm like, how far are down are they going for this sample? Like m most of the drilling that we saw for Pathfinder were, you know, half inch, right? Ba barely broken on the surface. Yeah, I think that Pathfinder uh, grinding that they were doing was to just to remove the surface layer of the rock because they were doing XRF uh, 
in situ uh, sort of measurements. So they ground off the surface and looked a little ways into the rock. Uh, whereas for Perseverance, they're actually doing core drilling uh, to get down into the surface a ways. And they they uh, are going to uh, put each of those samples into a metal tube and uh, mark where they're sitting on the surface so that a later mission can come back and grab those things as a sample return. Yeah. Isn't I, that cool? I know. I, I was doing a lot of studying on, on the Perseverance mission in the, over the last few days. And it's just, it's fascinating because we're, we're, we're talking about um, different um, meteorite uh, touch and goes tags, uh, returning yeah. samples. Um, we're talking about landing stuff on the moon recently, taking off to the moon in the future. Missions not only landing on Mars in the next 10 days or eight days, but then for the next two years, just a plethora of data coming our way. Yep. Now, when, when we uh, toured the lab at um, University of New Mexico, Albuquerque, we got to see the Mars room and there on the current rover, Curiosity, uh, they got to do some of the pointing, of, you know, what, what the chem cam and, and one of the other visible cams where it was pointing. Do we know who is uh, working with, with the Perseverance team? Is it any of those local universities? We'll have to uh, learn and share because okay, I don't know. Cool. Yeah. So thanks, Pat, for taking notes on that. That'll be something that we definitely want to share. Um, I, I had a, um, I, I have a, a ton of people reach out to me, um, Dale, hourly <laughs> for hey, can you identify this? Is this a meteorite? And that's why everyone who instant messages me automatically gets a reply. Don't ask me to ID stuff. Every once in a because a lot of times you're not respected. Uh, after you give them the answer they don't want, uh, you're not respected. And so I just made a habit of, hey, it's just not, it's just not my cup of tea. I, I'm not qualified. I'm not in a position to, to make a comment on terrestrial material. Because that's their next question. Well, if it's not a meteorite, what is it? I don't know. No. But every once in a while, I have an interaction with someone. Like I, I talked about two weeks ago, uh, the husband and wife who are kind of bickering back and forth if they found a meteorite or not, and the wife may be right. Um, more, to, more to come. Stay tuned. Um, but I had another YouTube uh, viewer reach out to me with a super unique rock. And... It was unique enough, and he wanted me to see it enough that he sent it to me. And I will tell you that um, he is the exact opposite of most people. Respectful of my time to the point where he sent the sample in with a generous donation that will cover the cutting expenses that he wanted done to the rock but also be, allow me to send him a, when I send him the, the, the stone back, um, allow me to include a meteorite for him and also a little extra cash to keep the uh, outreach that I do once a week because this takes my entire day uh, to keep me going on that. So many, many thanks to my YouTube viewer on that. And when on that, let's get right into it. So hold on. All right, so this is the sample, and the big thanks goes to Dave Portwood um, for not only being a YouTube viewer, but for subscribing. And I think you get extra cool points, not only for subscribing, but going through and liking all the videos. I don't know, that's what I heard. But uh, Dave Portwood uh, sent in this sample that was so unique, I had to take a look at it up close and uh, Dave, thank you for your generosity as well. Um, this is what we're looking at. So let me see here. The overall shape is just too round for me. It doesn't look like it has a fusion crust on it. 
It just looks like a dark stone. I don't see uh, these marks right here. I, I, I do see, but those are not flow marks. Those are not flow lines in the fusion crust. Those are scuff marks. When we look at the interior, <clears throat> it's beautiful for an earth rock, but as you can see, there's no metal content whatsoever. You see there's no glints of metal at all. It is not magnetic whatsoever. And when you zoom in, hopefully it'll stay in focus a little bit. Yeah. You don't see any chondral formations whatsoever. You just see random chaotic shapes and swirls and uh, really glassy content to some of it, like that right there. Looks very glassy. Um, this around the top has a darker line right around the edge, right around the edge here. I don't believe that is fusion crust whatsoever. I don't believe that is uh, heating. Uh, result of heating. I do think it is uh, a terrestrial weathering line. Um, this is probably an old stone. It's been around for a while, through some water for a while, maybe out in the sun for a while. I have no idea what the texture is on the outside, why it's so black, and what the coating <laughs> looks like. But I am saying that this is 100% a terrestrial suspect. A very interesting stone. It's just too perfectly round. The outside appearance does not look right. I looked at it under a cross-polarized reflected light uh, today and didn't see anything that I liked. But this is the review of it right now that I'm seeing, and I don't see really anything that looks meteoritic about it. So that's how I look at and review a suspect um, meteorite. The overall well, shape I was supposed to go is to another just... Video. Um, so if you look at this, this is the, um, let me exit this. If you look at this, this is the uh, exterior of the rock. Um, that substance or whatever with the scuff marks on it, I have no idea what that is. Right now I'm going to do a surface burn test. Hold on a second. Why is that not... Right now I'm going to do a surface burn test on what I think may be a fake uh, fusion crust or just a weird fusion crust. So I have my knife glowing red hot and putting it on the fusion crust and it does burn. which is not a good sign. I'm going to say that is not fusion crust. So I, I don't know what that is, but that is what's on the stone and that's not how fusion crust reacts. Um, it actually left uh, residual on my knife. but just a, a weird rock and extremely glassy on the interior. Usually, so forgive me for interjecting here. Yeah, but, uh, yeah so, you know, I have a, I kind of do stuff in paleontology. So I know a wee bit about geology, like just enough to offend geologists. <laughs> uh, but typically... Uh, I know uh, in a lot of the fossil stuff we find, whenever they're black, they it's it's a phosphate, and that looks very typical of something that has been fossilized or 
whatever you want to call it. So I think that the black on the outside is it is it's been that rock has been mineralized in in phosphate. Yeah, I don't think it would fail uh, the uh, the hot metal test though if it were uh, re really a chemical coating. I think it's more likely. <laughs> so uh, Toper did show me this one earlier, <clears throat> and I think. More likely, all the parallel lines are probably brush marks. Uh, I think this has had a uh, a coating added to it. Now, I know I know nothing about the rest of the situation, and I don't want to offend anybody. But um, any any of the natural rock coatings, I don't think would would work that way with. I've with never heat seen a rock burn like that. Yeah, uh, and although it is interesting that, and I think Topper's comment is right on that, you know, it's dark around the edges, and so I think that is weathering rind. Um, the glassiness that we see uh, internally in a lot of the grains there, uh, I bet money that that's quartz that we're seeing in yes. a few different uh, varieties of quartz. Under the microscope, I, I identified some quartz. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, absolutely a meteoron and uh, failing the hot pin test. Yeah, um, but just a, a super interesting, uh, let me see here. One second, I got to pause this. All right, so Dave was exactly correct in saying it's a beautiful rock and kind of worthy of cutting. So it was cut. <laughs> I have a bunch of slices here. Um, it was so glassy that I didn't even try to cut this. I went down to uh, my local uh, rock shop uh, lap and lapidary shop. They have 15 saws. So big shout out to Natural Expressions and Gilbert. Uh, Fred, man, he's old as a rock himself. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, if you want a rock in the back, you might want to start before him um <laughs> no great guy though um so um dave actually wanted to get some slices of it and i think we were able to make him happy we got enough beautiful full slices here that he can give one to every family member and once he throws that on the lap it's going to be beautiful we do oh, see look at that porosity yeah. there i was i just saw that on this slice myself that's not and, good and look at the alignment of yep. the yep. grains as well that's yes. a crack filled in by other material bouncing down the stream or bouncing down the hill hmm that, that definitely looks sedimentary to me. It would just yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, and Toper, your your comment about the overall shape of the rock is also right on. It's that's the shape of a of a river cobble. Yeah. When when they cut it, did it cut pretty evenly? Uh, like it was a, a hard material. Oh, super hard. The first two slices, he said, were failures. Whoops, sorry. Uh, the first two slices were actually failures. Um, he couldn't get the blade to engage. It kept on riding off. Yeah. So this is, well, yeah, see, I, I just picked it up before the hangout. I was running across town. Um, this is one of, this is the first slice that he attempted. And he's, it looks good to me. That's I funny. mean, I don't know what the problem is with it, but he was very unhappy with it. So what, yeah. Here's the, no. the blade in, in really hard material that has a slanted surface with no, uh, places for the saw to catch the the blade wants to follow the contour oh, of the rock. This is this is it right here. Yeah, and so yeah, right. You'll yeah. you'll oh, you'll see this ledge. It, yeah, it's yeah. Right. I don't know so if it's coming put, across. There it is. Yeah, when you put it on the lap, uh, you know that part won't be flat. It won't be a full slice all the way out to the edge. Yeah. So the 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 first two have that have that issue, I guess. 
this one not not as much but yeah he he says it was murder trying to get the uh the blade to bite in it's so hard material so i asked i asked old fred what his opinion was and he scratched his head and i waited two and a half minutes and he said there's a lot of glass in there that's volcanic son hmm so that's that's fred (laughs) I don't know how accurate that information is, but uh, he did a hell of a cutting job on it, considering what uh, what I gave him to work with and the amount of time. So he, he did a, he did a great job. So all these slices will be going back to Dave. Uh, he actually got a lot more slices than he thought he'd get. And well, we're gonna call it a main mass, but he still has still wet, um, still has a, a good size main mass to uh to display yeah yeah mm-hmm. and there wow look at this let me let me sh- highlight this for a second it it may not it may seem kind of weird to be looking at a meteor wrong in so much detail on a meteorite channel but it's really important to know the differences so that's this is the other part of that uh that slice where we see uh, yeah, encroachment of other heavy. material yeah well that is not a typical earth rock yeah it's definitely a pretty rock but the term that i once heard thrown around from pat yesterday was pudding stone but i have no idea <laughs> yeah my i my my petrology for terrestrial stuff is not that good but that that's kind of a guess yeah wild ass guess yeah i but it, it, was, it was a good experience because it was someone who actually appreciated what i'm trying to do what we're doing here um on on youtube building uh a knowledge bolide of information about meteorites um and he uh like i said was was very generous with his donation not only for the for the cutting but uh i'll be able to include a, a meteorite for him uh in, in the return sample uh, in the return box that way at least he can have i can say look yeah at least you got a meteorite out of the deal <laughs> <laughs> does anyone have anything they uh, like to show off i don't see any hand raise but i know mike kelly might have some oh i do have a hand raise and it's a new one sweetness Let's go to uh, Bo. Bo McDaniel, you can unmute yourself and we'll go right to you. Yeah, so I uh, I just, I had two things they show up in the mail today that I uh, am pretty excited about. So the first one was, uh, this is like the first meteorite that I've like fallen in love with. And if I could marry an inanimate object, this would be it. Um, <laughs> but it's from, uh, it's from uh, Imolac. And Ooh. I'm trying to get I think we got a little bit of internet lag right now. So I'm gonna pause this. Yeah, we had a little bit of bad internet, but Bo's back with us. You're about to show us an Imalac? Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh like I said it's this is one just it's like as soon as I saw it, I fell in love with it. It has stone I mean, it, it almost looks more gemstone than meteorite. Um, and so, yeah, that's just, uh, that's my pride and joy. It's just, uh, you know, I, I catch myself just like dazing at it multiple times a day. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that's just, uh, like I said, that's just one that, you know, everybody wants to show off their pride and joy and that's mine. But one yeah. thing that's, uh, kind of cool was today, uh, believe, yeah, that was it. So, uh, ever since I've been collecting, which hasn't been like super long. I learned that there was a fall here in my hometown uh, in Denton, Texas, and it's not common. Uh, it's an iron that was, uh, I think it was like 1856. I wrote it on the back here. Yeah, it's found in 1856. But when they found it, they took it to a blacksmith, and the blacksmith like decided to heat it and make a bunch of stuff with it. So uh, it's not easy to find. Uh, and I reached out to a guy. Uh, I've been kind of reaching out to a lot of people, but anyway, all that reaching out, I actually finally found one. Mm. Uh, and so, yeah, having one that fell in my own hometown here is just, uh, just really awesome to me. So that's fantastic. That's What's the name of it again? I'm sorry. Can we see the bottom again? Yeah. Denton, Texas. Denton oh, County. 
Wow, it's actually named after the county you're in. Yeah. That is awesome. Those are really cool uh, display boxes, too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, this was, uh, I do a lot of, so it's it's these little trays. I actually just got this in today, too. Um, it's little trays of nine, and you can take them out individually and have the labels and stuff on the bottom. But, cool. uh, yeah, I got these today. Yeah, these are from uh, Rio Grande Supply. I have no affiliation with them. I pay full price like everyone else. But, uh, yeah, they, they have really cool stuff with displays like this and a gem jar displays as well. So. Is that one of right above Aquazarchus? Is that Allende? This one or this one? That one right there. This one is Allende. You are correct. Can we see that, please? That's beautiful. Yeah. And by the way, that um, that Imbolac, um, I don't want to. I don't want to just glance over the fact. I want to go back to that one for a second uh, after this. It, it looks like it has an eyeball. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, I like that. And Allende's um, birthday was just this last week. That is a beautiful okay. piece of Imolac. Thank you. Yeah, that was uh, – this is one that it was like as soon as I saw, it was like, well, I have to have that. That that has to come to its forever home. Yeah, and Imolac is a, is a classic uh, palisite. It's also totally, totally stable. It's just – it's not a ruster at all. Yeah, that was – that was one of the things that really drew me and really had me looking. I was looking for some of the ones like Imolax, a, a lot of the more stable ones. Just no one is yeah. selling them. You know, uh, so beautiful as well. It's just a real plus. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Awesome. Bo, Thank th you. Thanks for sharing, man. We definitely appreciate that. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, I'd be proud of that, Imalac. And what's neat about that one is uh, it looks like it's polished but not etched. So that's uh, kind of a rarity. A, a lot of times they're always etched. So it, I, every once in a while, I like having that that raw metal look. Um, let me see. We got two people. I'm going to New York first. We got uh, Bruce. So let me see here. Spotlight for everyone. Hey, Bruce. Hey, guys. How you doing? Fantastic. At least I, I am. <laughs> That's good. Um, so I picked up a slice of a Logenite, um, NWA13354 from Mark Lyon. It's the card. Mm. And here, let's see if I can get some light on this thing. Oh, man. So, wow. Yeah, a lot of, this, is, this is the first only loader night that i have let's try the other side oh man so that's a beauty loader nights are very rare yeah yeah as soon as i saw it I, uh, he actually had it listed up on ebay and i think he has the main mass on ebay and uh yeah i saw that and i'm like i don't have that <laughs> so. is that a full slice I'm it, not it entirely of, sure because it's like it's got, you know. Well, the, the rounded edge I, is, is definitely a natural edge. Yeah. So I'm not sure if this, yeah, I mean, this I, has like a little weathering. I don't know if it shows up. I didn't really I, like look at it closely. Yeah, I can't, I think so that, I can't tell if, if this broke off or, uh, you know, mm -hmm. or if that's, you know, the way that it, you know landed well if there if it shows weathering on that on that potential broken edge then it's definitely not a uh a, a cutting accident it's it's that's the way it was before it was cut yeah it, it's so, it's just it's hard to tell yeah you gotta look, so, look at, under a, a, man. You know, a loop yeah. or something that has a great structure to it man yeah it's you know i got it and it's like whoa <laughs> <laughs> pretty yeah. cool Beautiful. So now, is that is that, that pardon my ignorance, but you know, like I said, there's no egos here. Is is that thing magnetic? Do you know something? I didn't take a magnet to huh. it. Yeah. Um, well, we'll we'll I, come back to you on a report for that. Yeah, because, I'll go grab one and and check it out. So. Yeah, awesome. Um, let's go to uh, Mike Kelly. 
Hey, how's it going? Just a just a Bruce great piece, and there's uh there's 96 of those total, including all of the um the pairs from Antarctica. So obviously every Antarctic find, you know. Yeah, a lot of them, a lot of more Antarctica. So there's not a lot of them. Yeah, wow. there's not a whole lot of that out there. That's a very that's, cool piece. That's why I was I was really curious if it's a full slice because a full slice lodronite is even more rare of that size, you know. Yeah. So, I got a. I had, a, I had a good week. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good week. We'll start with the, the ephemera. So I, I thought this was kind of interesting when I got it because I wasn't exactly expecting what I got. And then when I looked it up, uh, it, it, it very much matches all the other pieces I'm finding on the internet of it. Um, so this is Henbury Crater Impactite from Australia. So Ooh. obviously there's there's a fair amount of little henberries out there. Um but you don't see this very often, you know, it is available out there. Um, but it's, it's almost, it almost looks like, uh, the very vesicular basalt you see, um, you know, that people are throwing in the bottom of their barbecues, but that's, uh, that's an impact glass from, uh, from that series of craters. So I picked that up because I wanted to, uh, to throw it in with my little henberries. I've never seen a henberry impact eye like that ever. Yeah. And I think it'd be uh, it'd be cool to uh, to to cut it and uh, get a clean face on one side to see what the inside looks like. Get to see all the, the vesicles really well. On, so on, the was... si on the side facing us, the orange parts is that oxidized meteorite chunk still, or is that the sand color? That's that's just soil, I believe. I don't think there's any any okay. actual inclusion in there. Like with uh, I know way bar, you'll on some of the way bars you'll get uh, magnetism in there because there's bits of iron in there. So. Yeah, there's there's no reaction at all. Okay. So it's before, you, oxidized, but. before you go on to the next item, because you mentioned the way bar and they gave me a shout out today, I definitely want to give a shout out to Beth and the entire crew over at Aerolite Meteorites down in Tucson. They did a live this morning and a uh, live sale. And they had uh, way bar iron, way bar impact tights, way bar glass, and even had way bar uh, impact material with iron meteorite in it. And it looked very similar to this. That's why I wanted to ask just because Aerolite educated me today. So shout out to them. Yeah, that's that's an interesting uh, impact tight to have uh, little bits of it in there. So that's really cool. And yeah, the, the way bar was I, I got a piece in my collection of everything but a pearl, uh, which are really hard to find. Uh, yeah. You know, where they're they're little perfect like black glass spheres um, that were aerially ejected versus some of the other um, uh, low uh, ground based um, impact tights that came out of way bar. Um, but uh, yeah, you don't see way bar too often. Um, this was the next little thing I got. I don't know if it's going to show up too well. Um, I'm trying to do all of the, uh, the subtypes, uh, for all of the achondrites, chondrites, and, and irons. Um, but I, I took it one step further and I was trying to do all of the, um, uh, chemical, uh, magmatic, and also, um, mineral types of the different, um, meteorites. So this is uh, this was one that I was missing and it caught my eye. It's an olivine picritic shergatite. So it, it's in the Met Bowl. It's just a shergatite, uh, but this is uh, this is 1068 uh, and it's picritic. So it's got a uh, very ultramafic uh, content to it and, uh, and very very high in olivine. Um, so this was this was part of a, a set I ended up getting at. And this was from the, the meteorite market back when they were still in uh, in Alaska versus up in uh, I believe he's in Washington now from uh, Eric Tolker. Um, another piece of that set was another kind of cool one that uh, that you don't see too often because it's it's pretty rare. Uh, so I was missing a, a mesociderite uh, 2B subtype. Um, so mesociderite 2Bs, there are a total of, how many of them are out there? Um, there are a total of seven of them out there. Uh, and what uh, uh, the mesociderites are kind of interesting. So the, the A, Bs, and Cs are, are based on the, the uh, silicate compositions. So this one has more clinopyroxene in it than plagioclase, uh, which is intermediate, which is higher than the orthopyroxene inside of there. Uh, so this is cool because that, that's actually got a little bit of crust along the one yeah. edge. Um, wow. And again, and it's uh, the not total, overly prevalent. The total known weight is nothing. 
Yeah, yeah, the total known weight on that one was uh, was pretty small. <laughs> wow, what a so, what uh, a great piece! I, I I did note that in my catalog after uh, loss to the uh, or uh, uh, reposit of the uh, the type specimen. There is there's not much of that to go around. Man, that's phenomenal. Um, one of move, seven move, too. Yep, moving up to even higher metal content and even less pieces this is guanaco which is a, a 2g iron so there's a total of only six of these out there in the world um <laughs> and uh this was my second one um and i'll be showing this again next week because the you can see it's it's polished on one side but based on you see the way the light is it's curved mm -hmm. um and the, the back side uh, is like fresh from the butcher shop <laughs> So this will be headed out to the uh, the garage to get refaced, flattened on both sides, and then uh, etched. I'm interested to see what the etch looks like on there. Um, do take accurate weights before and after. I'm I'm very interested in tracking that. Certainly will do. Yeah, that's easy enough. I said it, it, it was a good week. It's kind of a cool one. This is another another rarity. So this is a uh, Rumorudi. This is an R um, three point six. Mm. Uh, so there are a total of um, four of these out in the world. This is NWA 4360. Um, so this was one of the uh, the eight rumorudis that aren't brecciated types that I was looking for. Um, and, and finally, was able to find a piece in, and get that in there. And it's got a lot of really cool chondrules sitting in there. Um, and I got chain of custody that gets all the way back to... Uh, to Hanno Struf, who is the uh, the listed main mass holder on there, as you can see, with the Fantastic. cards. That was kind of fun. Yep. Wow. Then I got three more little ones to go. This was another one that came in the set. Uh, so another subtype I was missing was a uh, lunar basalt. So this is an olivine uh, uh, pyroxene bas uh, basalt, and uh, it's an early NWA. Uh, oh, and this no. was kind of cool because when I came – the display was kind of like jostled in the mail and was sitting a little lower uh, and you couldn't see that this was actually a lying piece on it. So I popped <laughs> open the display and, you know, slid the piece back into its little spot and uh, checked it out without the glass on it and then saw that it was a lying piece. So that was really cool. I didn't wow. know that before I came here. Wow. Um, NWA 032. Yeah. And so there are, uh, there are a total of 19 lunar basalts out there in the world uh, that we have now. Um, of which 10 of those are from Antarctica. So you're not getting those <laughs> ones. So that basically makes it like a one of nine available. Um, and out of a uh, 41st uh, LPCS uh, 2010 conference, so they did radiometric dating on this. This is like the youngest lunar basalt that we have a sample of. Cool. You know, whether it be from meteorites or also the lunar return samples, um, this, this is it. So this is a, a 2.8 GA uh, age range on it and they're thinking some of the basalts are as young as one GA old um, wow. but so far this is it this is the youngest we got out there um, and then this is a cool little one this was uh, Nadia Bondi um, so what caught my eye on this one was there was provenance all the way back to Professor Otto who um, did the second batch of mineralogy on the specimens so originally they found one piece of this uh, in 1956, uh, it was a single stone fall, uh, and then they went back years and years and years later and came out with like another 350 little mini ones. Oh my God. So this is a complete little mini individual uh, with chain of custody all the way back to the professor who did the mineralogy on it. Fantastic. What's the name of that again? Nadia Bondi. Man, you always surprise us with unique, like, really obscure stuff yeah and this is the last one this one this shout out goes to john higgins so nice for, for a while i've been getting close to my next collection milestone which was uh 600 pieces uh and so that finally happened so <laughs> waiting waiting cool. for this to uh to finish classification uh, but uh, shout out to John. Thanks for this piece. I love it. Now, uh, now I got to work my way up to 700. <laughs> <laughs> well played. Good stuff, man. Thanks a lot. Yeah, you did have a good week, man. Yeah. Weight wise too. 
number of samples, but also weight wise. You, you outdone yourself for a micro man. <laughs> That's fantastic. Oh, we got Bruce. Come, let's go back to Bruce for a second. Oh, looks like the Lodronite is magnetic after all. Yep. I couldn't find a weak magnet. I put it on a strong one, and it's like, yeah, it's definitely hanging on around there. Hmm. Okay, nice. So. Good good to know. Thank you, Bruce. Appreciate that. Yeah, and Bruce, keep track of that one and, and maybe store it like you store your irons or treat it like you treat your irons, you know, because there, there is a lot of metal in there. Um, I, I had a high metal brocheated Lodronite, and it was one of the few – stonies that i have that you know i gotta I, I, it's sitting in with the irons you know because it was it was getting a little bit of rust around the edges so so mm -hmm. keep an eye on it it's a beautiful piece great thanks for the advice yeah yeah it is beautiful i i don't have a piece that like that um and that's another thing that that would be a good subject to talk about is uh is meteorite preservation we've hinted about it we've talked about it a few times maybe a a, a show dedicated to how to curate your your collection to have it uh, around as long as possible. So um, uh, we have Pat Brown. From, there we go. What you got for us today, buddy? Okay. Well, I got a couple things. So this is one that uh, that's been uh, in my collection for a long time. It's a really interesting shape. Uh, that has a bunch. So th this is looking at a reflected cross-polarized light. So you can see through some of the crest, but let's add some, uh, if it'll autofocus. Still haven't replaced this camera. Um, the, uh, turn off that light. There we go. Now I'm going to see the ragamuglyphs. Bunch of ragamuglyphs in this piece. Yeah. And this uh, little notch over here is very interesting too, because there's a bunch of ragamuglyphs on on the other side of the notch. So there was there was plasma flowing through that notch <laughs> as it uh, transited the atmosphere. And this one does show some flow lines, but it's sandblasted enough that uh, that they're very hard to see. But a, a, a really interesting shape on that one. And it, do, it does have one big rounded oh, yeah. surface. So um, whether you can call this certainly not fully oriented, but it might be it might be partially oriented. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's a and full of ragmaglyphs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, th yeah. Um, it's got gobs and gobs of ragmaglyphs on it. And under that lighting, you can actually see the contraction cracks in the crust too. Uh, yes, you can. You can. Under and... normal lighting, we couldn't see that. So that's one of the benefits of the cross polarized light is yes. we could not see it. There was too much shine and reflection off the surface. Right. And this this setup reduces and diminishes that. Yeah. And you have to play with the with the level, but yeah, you can looking at things that reflect across polarized light is like a whole nother world. Um, and because um, Allende had a birthday pretty recently here. Have to, Show off a slice of Allende. Nice. Now those dark spots are those pits? Are those little holes, or is that is that light trickery? No, those that's uh, uh, a trick of the light. Those are uh, dark chondrules that uh, I think it's probably safe to say are armored chondrules mm. um yeah i'm not getting the best look at that one but you can see um the the white amoeboid shaped areas those are our cais mm -hmm. so this thing is really fragile and just whisper thin <laughs> 
And then uh, at some point, uh, I want to do a, uh, a talk on uh, scales uh, or a little, little presentation on scales. The um, uh, scales that we most commonly use, <clears throat> you know, are, are little things like this one. Uh, this is a little fancier than most. <clears throat> it comes with a pan and it comes with a calibration weight. Um, and so th these, these type of scales use a, an electronic load cell. And if calibrated <clears throat> and kept at a constant temperature, they actually are quite accurate and quite linear when calibrated. But there can be calibration issues. Uh, this one, when you, um, when you go to calibrate it with the weight that's included, this is, supposed, this is a, a 50 gram scale, but uh, if you calibrate it with the weight that they include, it displays zero to 20 grams. Uh, so over, oversight on their part. Yeah. Uh, and in, so when you, when you calibrate it with a 50 gram weight, <clears throat> it works great. Um, so at some point we'll talk about uh, uh, standard weights and traceability and, and uh, some, some practical uh, examples of how to use and how not to use um, these uh, inexpensive, accurate load cell sort of uh, scales. Okay. Yeah. And why it's important to have accurate measurements too, because I was at a uh, rock show uh, outside and I was trying to sell some, I forget what it was. I think it was either lunar or Martian and I was using my, my scale and uh, mine as well has a, you know, specimen tray, but also a 10 gram uh, calibration weight. And no matter what I did, I could not get an accurate weight. It was just fluctuating up and down, up and down, driving me and the client crazy because he wanted it as low as possible. I wanted it as heavy as possible. And then I realized, oh, my God, you close the wind guard. All of a sudden, it's a constant number. <laughs> so yeah. that's what this is. It's not only to protect the load cell, but also when you're weighing things out in the wind or actually under my ceiling fan, this is so sensitive, it actually fluctuates under the ceiling fan. So yeah. it's... Yep. So, uh, so scales go that go milligram <clears throat> generally will have some sort of enclosure around them. This is a, a up to 300 grams by one milligram scale. And the sartorium here is uh, only goes up to 13 grams, but it measures to a tenth of a milligram. And it has a, an enclosure around it uh, that you open and close. And uh, uh, if you want to weigh to a tenth of a milligram, it takes a lot of fussing around to, uh, mm -hmm. to get it right. So at some point in the future, we'll have uh, a, uh, a discussion about that. And uh, I think that's about all I've got. Okay. Well, I do have uh, a check-in from our European friends. So let me hit pause real quick. All right. So we're going to check in with our international guests. We have three videos today, uh, Maxine, Marco, and Andre. Now, I do want to give a little shout-out again to another uh, YouTube viewer. Let me just stop and say, please subscribe down below, click like, trick YouTube into liking us. Um, John Taylor was watching our, our uh, replay last week when we were talking about the brown fusion crust that we were seeing. And he shared a link from the meteoriterecon.com webpage. And if you've never been to that webpage, uh, I mean, like I said, they're, Aero Light's my competition, they're my competition, but this is all about education. It's not monetarily driven. They have fantastic webpage, great information, great education, a good place to stop and learn about stuff. Um, but this uh, was given to me by John Taylor and he basically, this is copied and pasted from Meteorite Recon. So the, the brown uh, effect is actually the trailing side 
and it's due to the uh, the oxidation process. And I'm trying to find it, the amount of uh, magnetite content. So mm -hmm. it is very normal to find a brown fusion crusted fresh fall on the trailing side. So thank you, John, for not only tuning in for the replay, but hey, we don't know everything and we love to, we love to learn. So Maxime uh, sent in a video and I, I, I just love, I mean, the, some of the close-ups he has are phenomenal. Hi everyone, Maxim here. I hope you're all doing good. So now it's microscopy time. So today we will have a look at some specimens under the microscope and I will give some explanations about them. So let's go. The first one is Abba Panu. I recently posted a picture of it on Facebook, so maybe you have already seen it. So Abba Panu is an L3 ordinary chondrite that fell in Nigeria in 2018. You can clearly see the metal flakes and the large closely packed chondrules, what is coherent with a type 3 chondrite. I rapidly noticed that little strange inclusion right here, having that spinifex texture, which is very different from the rest of the meteorite. It was told to me that it was probably an impact melt that cooled down so quickly that it allowed that kind of spinifex texture crystallization. This is also called supercooled impact melt, and I find it beautiful. Very interesting. Especially the fact that it's on the corner, so it's like 3D, you can, you can see it in three dimensions, and that's, that's absolutely great. Cool. Yeah, they're also called quench crystals, occasionally. Next is that little slice of Samechan. So Samechan has a very heterogeneous texture, and I thought it could be interesting to look at that more closely. And I wasn't disappointed. On this slice, the iron part is highly heterogeneous. You can see many Wittmann-Statten patterns embedded in larger inclusions. Also, the orientation and thickness of the Wittmann-Statten patterns is highly non-uniform, making me think it is like different iron fragments were packed together randomly. But my best discovery in this little slice is that colorful translucent crystal, whose colors are absolutely stunning. Looks like a little supernova. Lastly, you can see the metallic structure deformation near the crust of the meteorite, probably due to the shearing of the meteorite during its fall, what is a testimony of the violence of the meteorite's fall. Also, if you look closely, you can see the continuity between the wittmann statin patterns and the fusion crust. But it's very nice to see. Then, last but not least, I showed you last week my new fragments from Gurara 3 from Toffer and wanted to show you more precise microscopic images of it. So here you can see that wonderful crust more precisely and when you zoom on it, it almost looks like plastic and that is absolutely incredible. I've never seen such thing before. And also you can see on that crust some kinds of translucent crystals and I don't know if this is sand or if it comes from the inside of the meteorite and I think this is from the inside of the meteorite. But that is beautiful. Then next as always here are some random pictures of specimens. Beautiful. Yeah, 3118 is, is one of the prettier carbonaceous. Wow, look at that, that card. Look at all the iridescence. Yeah, I was going to say blue. Yeah. Oh, 7325. Yeah, beautiful. The original non mercury mercury. <laughs> yeah. That's it for today guys, I hope you enjoyed the video and I wish you have a great hangout today guys and see you awesome. next week. Thank you so much man, great video.
Really appreciate it. And the um, Gorora 003. The Hi, everyone. Crust, Maxim here. I hope you will. The fusion crust is translucent uh, and almost transparent, I mean, uh, in places. So you probably are seeing the eucritic material coming through the fusion crust. Right. And if you use the reflected cross-polarized light scheme, you'll see right through that crust. Hmm. Um, Pat, what did you call that um, earlier in the in the video? You mentioned a name. Yeah, the, the, in, in Abu Panu, the the uh, crystals that he was co uh, calling had a spin effect sort of um, appearance. Uh, that is also called quench crystals, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a kind of <laughs> semi-professional name for it. Um, it, it, they, it is material that cooled very rapidly and didn't get to fully crystallize. Uh, in my uh, collection of um, uh, Chelyabinsk meteorites, where I got to high grade several kilos to pull out all the little <laughs> oriented ones and stuff, a lot of them on the backside, in the small, you know, subgram oriented ones, in the center of the backside, you'll see those quench crystals as well. Wow. Thank so it's you. Indicative of very, very fast cooling rate. Nice. Well, it matches what he says. Awesome. So now we're going to stop in with uh, Marco in Germany and beautiful orientation. Hello, guys. I hope you're all doing good and you have fun at the great hangout today. I prepared some oriented meteorites today to show. So, come on, let's have a look on them. Okay, the first piece for today is this little, only 16 gram, unclassified chondrite. It's a very special piece for me. Not because its orientation is so special, it's, uh, yeah, I would say only a little heat shield. But this was my first oriented meteorite in my collection. And to be honest, mm, that was a big mistake to buy this one. Because with buying this one, I got infected with that <laughs> incurable disease called oriented meteorite uh, addiction. <laughs> Yeah, as you can see, it's, um, like I said before, a sh little heat shield. It shows uh, some flow lines. It's a little bit weathered. And next we will have a look on the backside of the piece. Yeah, and here we have the backside of the piece. As you can see, it shows a nice rollover lip. It's uh, complete, it's not broken. So a nice little heat shield and yeah, a couple of years ago, I definitely had to buy this piece. <laughs> the one that started it all. Looks like a little coffee bean. <laughs> yeah, that, that is gorgeous. Look at all the little blobs of fusion crust on the center of the backside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the next piece is this 277 gram oriented meteorite. It's also an unclassified NWA chondrite. And uh, what is really interesting on this piece is that the front side is not curved. It's extremely flat. And of course you can see nice flow lines here on the front side. but. If we have a look here on this direction, you can see the flatness of the piece. That's quite unusual. Look at those flow lines though. Dripping. Yeah, unfortunately the back side of the piece is broken. It would be so interesting to know how the piece looked as a complete stone but yeah not possible because as you can see the backside is broken 
Yeah, on that view you can also see the flatness of the front side of the piece and the nice rollover lips. And here again, the nice radial flow lines. Unbelievable. Yeah, the last piece that I want to show you today is this 535 gram oriented heat shield. It's also a very flat sample, but as you can see, also the backside is broken. So we don't really know how the original shape of that piece was. The pretty side of the piece is definitely the front side, as you can see here with its nice radial flow lines. But also on the back side, on the broken back side of the piece, there is a little part with crust. And there you can see bubbles, so the typical frothy fusion crust of an oriented meteorite. But yeah, that's the pretty side of the piece. No question. Wow. Yeah, that's another beauty. How does he find these? That's uh, nothing that a large amount of money won't fix. <laughs> that's the crusted part of the backside of the piece with the bubbly fusion crust. Okay, guys, that's what I wanted to show today. Um, I hope you will have a fantastic hangout now and um, as always I can't wait to see tomorrow on YouTube. So have fun, enjoy the hangout and see you next week. Bye bye from Germany guys. Nice. Thank you Marco. Great video man. Yeah. I want to I wanna visit him and touch all of his meteorites because you can literally see the flow lines just dripping over these things. Wow. Well, this is the potential one that we already looked at. Uh, now we're checking in with Andres. Um, remember we checked in with Andre, uh, I think last week or the week before, and he did his, uh, a 12 minute, uh, long tour of his, uh, collection, kind of an overview, but he, mainly focuses on European falls uh, and European meteorites in general. Can anyone figure out what he focused on this week? <laughs> Every single one of these is a, uh, I almost said carnivorous, <laughs> carbonaceous meteorites. So let's check in with uh, Andre as he shows off some of his uh, uh, rare and old. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and these are type samples, Vigorano, Vigali. Uh, so they're, they're the type samples of the various carbonaceous. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know if I can move this out of the way or not, but I can't see the title of this one from Hungary. So we're going to have to pay attention to the video for it. <laughs> Hi, everyone. This is Andries from the Netherlands again with a small contribution to this evening's Hangout. Because it's Ayende's birthday this week, I decided to show you some of my other carbonaceous meteorites. Some are small, some are a little bigger. I hope you enjoy the video. Bye. First, a small one, but nice. CV7. One of two. Another small one, <laughs> CR7, as you can see on the label, <laughs> my name is on it. It's a funny story. It was, uh, I got it as a gift from a seller at the NSSIM show and he put it right in his uh, selling display and uh, he had me uh, searching the whole display to find <laughs> this box for me. <laughs> so it will stay in my collection forever. That's awesome. Another nice one. Orgo, France. Most of you know this one. Again, Mother's Peace, which doesn't want to be on the camera. 
another one, nice one from my European collection. Lancé France, CO 3.5. Very hard to get. Yeah. Mihai. That's what the CMs are named after. Very happy with this one. Another rare carbonaceous, Kaba, Hungary. Also very hard to get. Are you noticing the years on all these? Then one, all of you know. Aqua Sarkas. There's even some dirt on it still. Really nice piece. Yeah. Big chunk too. Yeah, and very iridescent in the crust as well. Another one, Dofar 1762. CO? CO3. Hmm. Very thin slice. Almost dropped it there. <laughs> Some nice inclusions. And a lot of the COs are uh, very dark. Nice piece. That one has a, a lot of lighter color. Then I have NWA 11607 CK36. With some huge inclusions. Again, very thin. Yeah. Very nice slice. Subtyped 3.6. Then I have NWA 10119. I think that was a, a three through six, so that's a brachiation in there. Only CO3 melt breccia. Total known weight, 26 grams. Jeez. That's my favorite piece in his collection. <laughs> and last but not least, I think you heard this one. Yeah. Figarano. Mm -hmm. Type specimen for CV meteorites. The only one I will not take out of the box. <laughs> wow. Well, that was my small contribution. I hope you enjoyed it and hope to see you someday live. Bye bye. Awesome. Thank you. Wow. What? I'm, I'm, I have a smile, like my face hurts from staring and smiling at my screen. These are like meteorites I've never, I don't own any of those. Uh, and I think that was. There's yeah, another but, really cool uh, backstory to that one too. Uh, the the CV3 uh, Vigorano type uh, carbonaceous chondrites are very scientifically interesting. And, but they were really very, very scarce until something happened in February of 1969. Uh -huh. Allende. Yes. And so Allende had like a triple crown thing going on. So it's a very rare subtype. Uh, and that fall delivered a massive amount of material, just hundreds of kilos. And... Uh, we built the Lunar Receiving Laboratory in 1969, and they had the best and the brightest uh, uh, people ready to work on moon rocks. They had the very best equipment money can possibly buy, and they're waiting for moon rocks. And guess what get delivered in their lap? Not really all that far from Houston. Yeah, wow. So Allende is 
uh, one of the most studied uh, meteorites ever, period. It, it shows up in tens of thousands of research papers. Um, so that was a, it was a super, super blessing and uh, right place, right time. And there was so much of that material. Now it's, it's, I mean, it's still widely available. Um, but, um, Dr. Uh, Lawrence Garvey at ASU was telling, uh, me the story. And I think it might've been on one of our lives, but, um, he was telling me that when the event actually happened afterwards, they had people, at least a person drive up with their car in low rider mode because it was loaded trunk, back seat, passenger seat with Allende. As much Allende as they could fit in this car, they drove it up from Chihuahua, Mexico, went to ASU, which were stopping at all the universities and, and along the way trying to sell it. And I think it was offered to ASU, if I remember correctly, around a buck to two bucks a gram, take as much as you want. And he went through there, maybe it was Carlton Moore, uh, went through there and picked out like three or four and was like, yeah, I'm, I'm good. And, and now he's like kicking himself going, oh my God, I should have just wheelbarreled it. <laughs> yeah, Allende, well, it, you know, being an anniversary, the price has probably spiked a little bit, but it's very common to pay uh, 20, 25 bucks a gram. Uh, when I was... Uh, when I was first collecting uh, really nice Allende with labels and such was four bucks a gram. Wow. So, uh, maybe I'll break them out for a future uh, uh, show, but I've got a uh, hundred and forty ish gram quarter pound piece and uh, some small ones with, uh, with American meteorite labs, uh, labels um but yeah back in the day <laughs> yeah well meteorites are a great investment if you know what you're doing and so is the stock market <laughs> i have my money in meteorites <laughs> 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 and um we had uh i'm gonna go to ron uh because i know exactly what he wants to show Dude, and let me get my camera going here just yeah minute. this is this is worth it guys get hooked up here give me just a moment here yeah i would i would normally be chatting and tell you what he's going to show but i'm not stealing any thunder so oh, no, that's fine. Right. yeah <laughs> okay let me switch my camera here yeah and go to cam source there we go and shoot there you go boom this is this, no, it's backwards right, let me did you see it right right way uh, the, it's the no lighting? it's it, it's correct for us okay. looks like kentucky Oh, it's not Kentucky. It's a little, little further away than that. No, I meant the, the shape of it. Oh, the shape. Oh, <laughs> this is from Morocco. It's an NWA one 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 zero six that I just picked up. Um, the reason I bought this was because of the, the very very coarse grain structure. I mean, look how big that is compared to the centimeter cube. Um, yeah. I'm talking about this one up here. It's one solid crystal. These down here look like they might be multiples. This one here was gigantic. I can't believe how big that is. It's got to be two inches. Yeah, we you can't see where you're pointing. But... Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Around the uh, the top center, mm -hmm. the giant crystal under the under the black crust. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I got this from Mike Miller, Meteorite Finder. So shout out to him. Yeah, great guy. Um, yeah, I, I've got several of these things here. But the the difference in the in the grain, I mean, here you have... I mean, I can't point out how many way of showing, but that little dot in up in around the one o'clock position has has Newman lines, and to occur in an octahedrite. Um, so, and some of this I can't really see the crystal. So I was thinking about re-etching this thing, you know, like I've done several of the other meteorites. But what I wanted to ask this group, uh, you see these these black veins going through here will that be damaged if i if i go ahead and etch that or should i just leave it alone i, I, I need some input from you guys um 
So those are the grain boundaries, obviously, between yeah, yeah. and Camasite. Um, they will probably be uh, etched a little bit. Um, I mean, I'm concerned about this falling apart. Yeah, I don't think it's going to fall apart. Um, okay. Yeah, no, I, I am not an expert on irons or etching, but that that would be uh, a good one to post to Mendy's um, Facebook group that you uh, meteorites uh, impact their meteorites tectile impact. I yeah, I'm, I'm a member there. Yeah. Okay, and uh, also in the darkish grain in the lower left, uh, looks like you can see Neumann lines there too. Yeah, yeah, there's several places. So you know, one of the other reasons I bought this is because my last rock, even though this is a coarsest octahedrite, is what I'm calling it. The one before that was, remember this guy? You know, the finest, oh, I'll get my camera back a little bit. We'll see a little bit, bit better. <laughs> okay. Ah, shoot. No, I'll take out a holder here in just a second. I have to go old school on this thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. This one, come on, come on. Why is this not reacting? There we go. This is the finest octahedrite. There we go. So this one, I went from finest to coarsest. Mm -hmm. So that was that was kind of a, you know both ends of the spectrum. That's it crazy because a little, little bit of a lag to it. I can't. It's not in real time. You can really, really see like the 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 coarse grain on this one is so fine. It's like yeah, they're, yeah. Um. Yeah, so when it I, says I showed this one last week, but that compared to this guy down here, which is such a difference. Come on. <laughs> I'll get this right yet. There we are. It's such a difference. It just it, it just yeah. blew me away. And um, you chatted with me last night, and it's now even more evident when when I see it in this lighting. It's very reminiscent of Sakota Lin. It is. It is. It's it's in the same group. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's okay. beautiful. Entirely got to put this down. Okay. I'm Were you, I haven't found my answer yet, but that got me interested to look up. You know, what is the the coarsest? Because I kind of saw some broad definitions, and it was like three millimeters. I think was, uh, you know, the coarsest octahedrates, uh, and that one in the write ups is four millimeters. So I'm wondering how high yeah. they really go on coarsest yeah. octahedrates. Uh, Kempo de Cielo is also one that's fairly uh, has fairly wide tainite uh, plates or grains in it. Uh, one thing that has happened recently that's a windfall for iron collectors is the the big three volume Buckwald um, book on all the iron meteorites up to 1975. It has gone out of uh, copyright protection and there are scanned versions of it out there for free. As, hmm. as good PDFs. What's it uh, called? Uh, Buckwald. B u c h w a l d, and uh, I think the title of it is just uh, Iron Meteorites. Oh, okay. But it's a it, it's a it's a spectacular physical book. Uh, it's in three volumes in a slipcase, very very nicely bound, printed on super nice paper. Uh, but the second, the, the, you know, as many of the meteorite books back then, there were very few of us collectors. And so uh, they they never did very large print runs. And uh, Buckwald, if you can get a three volume set for 1500 bucks, you're doing well. Oh, 1500 bucks. <laughs> 2500 and once even $3,500. Wow. But wow. It, it has a spectacular write up about every known. Um, meteorite up to that point okay hey ron if you go to the met bowl and you look at one of the old ones uh, before 1975 there'll be a link to the online version of that section through uh, i think it's university of hawaii that's where you can get for free okay all right great thanks so just yeah just pull it up on met bowl oh, i'll do that right and we're always about sharing information especially when it's free <laughs> uh, i know i showed this one last week or two weeks ago but 
Um, it's another example of, this is a Campo de Cielo, and you can see the grain size in this. But just to show you that not everything is homogeneous throughout, when you look at the other side of this, it has massive yeah. grains. Yeah. Wow. Like this one here is just obscenely huge. I, I've, I, I, I'd be hard pressed to find another one that big. Wow. But what's interesting about this is like, you know, it's only wafer thin. No, it's only, you know, an inch and a half thick, but you would never think it's, it's the same meteorite. If I showed you that grain versus that. Yeah. 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 It looks like a different rock. You have to have square feet of surface of Campo to, to really make sense of the Vidmansat pattern there. Um, and Campos are really interesting too in that there uh, are some that are much uh, more weathered than others. Uh, they, they found a couple of new areas where they were recovering them. Uh, and Hans. Oh, La Palmas? Uh, uh, he has a real short last name. Uh, uh, Kofler, Kefler, Kofler, something like that. He's in Tucson every year selling Campos, and they stopped the export of Campos from uh, Argentina. But uh, uh, there are lots of them yeah. here, and that's one of those meteorites that, like Gibeon used or Gibson used to be, uh, not Gibeon, sorry, uh, used to be where it was. You could find them everywhere, and then all of a sudden, you couldn't find them anymore. Uh, mm. Campo is going to be that way at some point. Mm. Um, well, that's that's good to know that I already have, I already have my showpiece specimen. <laughs> so I'm I'm done. This is this is my I think seven and a half kilo one, and as you can see, it's getting a little bit of hand holding wear on it, which is nice. I I want it to have a little bit of patina on it. I touch it every single week. I bring it down off of its shelf and I let you guys stare at it for two hours right over here. So it has a nice shape and nice character yeah. to it as well. Yeah. I think we all have our trophy pieces of Campo. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's an easy way to get a good trophy. At least yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If, it, especially for irons and, and shapely irons, sometimes, yeah. you know, you're paying five to ten bucks a gram depending on the iron and that's just you know that's in a big piece yeah now you're talking about a smaller piece you're talking about a piece like you have that been painstakingly caressed on the saw yeah. and you know what i mean and then all the man hours that go into uh polishing it etching it and yeah, yeah. they're they're just they're cosmic gems man and they're spectacular yeah, one thing that i i kind of about a while ago was a, it, it, it's in the Campo del Cielo area, but it's a Campo Las Palmas. Yes. It's a fall that's uh, apparently um, 200 miles away, but it's confused with Campo del Cielo. Hmm. Um, I did buy a piece of that. It's on a shelf somewhere. You don't see it offhand. But they seem to be a little more sculptural than the Campo del Cielos. Mm -hmm. I mean, the ones I've seen, they're a little more twisted and they have a little more character to them. Yeah, well, back in the day when I bought my big Gibeon, it was 10 cents a gram. Oh, yeah. My, my, my first cap was 15 cents a gram. It's up to about $80 a year, dollar a gram now. Mm -hmm. wow. And Gibeon for a, a nice, a quality slice prepared the right way of Gibeon, you're looking $3.50 to $4 a gram. Oh, yeah. Easy. Easy. Yeah. yeah. So, well... That hopefully gives everyone an idea of uh, meteorite values and a little bit more information of uh, Kepler 10b and where it is in our solar system. And just I, I really hope everyone learned a little something today. Um, I don't see any hands up, so we're going to call it quits for the day. We're at two hours. That way I can start editing. And, oh, before we leave, Sam, do you have any update for us at all? Oh, I haven't heard anything yet. Okay. Science takes time, and it'll probably be several weeks slash months 
and I'll probably keep asking you every week. So oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm very anxious. Uh, for those that, that uh, haven't been keeping up with the saga, Sam uh, found some material on his land, and it's now in very reliable scientist's hands. Uh, it is some creepy, weird stuff, and he's got a lot of it. So we're paying attention to that. Uh, thanks, everyone. Appreciate it, and we'll see you next week, okay? Same. Good night. Everybody have a good week. Excellent job, Tucker. Right. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Fastest thanks, two hours on the planet. <laughs> yeah. The, the goal is to have fun and learn <laughs> and spend time with friends. Take care, guys. Bye. <laughs>